Welcome to this next video in the playlist on complex analysis. In this video, what we're going to do is further our discussion of complex differentiation, and then we're going to give an intuitive explanation of why the product and chain rules are true. Now, we're going to be studying the product and chain rules in the context of complex analysis, i.e. for complex differentiation. However, the explanations that we're going to give for why they are true are completely analogous to what you would use to justify them in real calculus, in standard calculus. So if you have stumbled across this video looking for an explanation of these rules for standard calculus, this video might not be completely useless to you. You will have to sit for a short discussion of complex differentiation initially, but you might find that very interesting as well. And then, as I say, when we get on to an intuitive explanation of the product and chain rules, um, it's completely analogous to the arguments that you would use in uh, real calculus. Final bit of introductory spiel. We're not going to give rigorous, meticulous explanations or proofs of the product and chain rule. We're going to give intuitive explanations as to why they are true. Now, these intuitive explanations could be rigorized. They can be turned into rigorous explanations, but we're not going to do that. Uh, it's fiddly and a little bit dull. Uh, so we're just going to stick with the intuitive explanations. Right, so let's begin. So we're going to start with just a little bit more discussion of the complex derivative. This video is a follow-on from the previous video in the playlist on complex analysis entitled Complex Differentiation. So, in the previous video we defined the complex derivative. So we said that if we have a function f of z, we can take the complex derivative of it, which we just call f prime of z, and that this is defined completely as we would expect it to be defined. It's the limit as h approaches zero of f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h. What I want to do now is just again impress on you the fact that this is different, very, very different to partial derivatives and directional derivatives. I just want to have a little bit of a further discussion of this. If you are seeing this, as I said again and again in the previous video, if you're seeing this, for the first time, you might be deceived into thinking how simple complex analysis is, how simple this is, because of course it looks completely the same as what you saw in real calculus. And indeed, when we gave examples of derivatives of polynomials, they all come out as being the same thing as what you would have expected them to be from real calculus. So it all looks incredibly simple, but this is deceptively simple, because remember, this isn't a real function, this is a complex function, this is a complex and Limit, and h is not just a real number, it is a complex number. So we are looking at a, at a limit that is converging from two dimensions rather than one dimension, and we are now dividing not just through by a real number as we were doing with this quotient in real calculus, we are dividing through by a complex number, and that is the bit that I really want to stress because I don't think I stressed that enough in the previous video. In the previous video, I took a lot of time to talk you through how this limit is converging from two dimensions rather than from one dimension, so it's converging from all directions. But I didn't stress to you enough, I don't think, about the fact that we are dividing for a, by a complex number and that that is essential for this to have any significant non-trivial meaning whatsoever. So let's just draw a picture and see what I mean by this. So. Uh, we'll draw our complex plane. So here is our domain of the function. Here is our codomain. And again, we have our point Z, which is just any point in the complex plane. Oh, and by the way, not all complex functions are going to be complex differentiable. A co function is said to be complex differentiable if this limit exists at a point Z0. And it's said to be complex differentiable over the entire complex plane if it exists for all points on the complex plane Z. Many complex functions will not be complex differentiable, i.e. many functions you could dream up from the complex plane to the complex plane. It would not be the case that this limit would exist at, and maybe not even at any of the points on the complex plane. So it's an amazing thing for this limit to exist. The functions where this limit exists for every single point of the complex plane are beautiful, beautiful functions, and they're the things that we're going to study in complex analysis because they're so incredible. Right, so back to the picture. So we have our point z. It's going to be mapped onto f of z over here, of course. 
and then we are adding on some little complex number h, so I might just change colour, and it's going to be quite big on the picture, otherwise the picture is just going to get confusing. So that vector is representing the translation produced by the complex number h, uh, and that's taking us to a new point up here, which is z plus h, and then we're saying find where that point is mapped onto in the codomain up here, f of z plus h, find what the difference between f of z plus h and f of z is, that complex number blue, which is what this thing at the top is here, and then take me the ratio between the original complex number h here and this new thing. So we take this and we divide it by the original complex number to get a ratio. And we are saying if this thing exists, then whatever direction you point in, then um, it converges on the same ratio between this one and this one. Um, so as you get very, very small, as you make h very, very small, whatever direction you come in, when you look at the ratio between the change in the codomain produced by this change in the domain and that change in the domain, it ends up being a fixed complex number, which is that what we call then the derivative at that point z. So I just want to stress again how different that is from partial derivatives and directional derivatives in uh, real, uh, well, in vector analysis. So let's just draw another picture down here. We'll go to green. So now let's imagine that we're dealing with R2, so this is R2 here, and then we're doing a mapping from R2 to R2, like so. Uh, so when we deal with vector functions from R2 to R2, we have two components, of course. We have the um, x and the y component in the codomain, and we study each of them independently. That's the way we do things with vectors. And then Let's say we're studying, and we'll use some different notations, and we'll call this the u-axis and this the v-axis. So let's say we're going to study the component u of x, y, where this is x and this is y. Then we can take partial derivatives of this component with respect to x and with respect to y, and then we can take directional derivatives. And in the previous video, I stressed to you the fact that when we take partial derivatives or directional derivatives, we are taking derivatives with respect to one dimension. So if we're taking a partial derivative with respect to the x-axis, we're imagining making a change in the x-direction. So we're adding on a little real number in the x-direction. So we're moving along this line if we had our point here in the uh, domain vector space here. We're just adding a component into the x part and seeing what change we produce over here in the uh, codomain, and then we look at each component of the codomain. And then we take the limit as that approaches zero, so we're taking a one-dimensional limit, equivalently with the partial de derivatives in the y direction, and when we take directional derivatives, we're then just saying, okay, here's a direction I want to go in, and again, we're taking a one-dimensional limit across that line. We're looking at how does the diff the um, ratio of the difference, convert? what does it converge to along that line, whereas in complex analysis we're going from all directions. However, it might have occurred to you to ask in the previous video, and I never explained this to you, and this is the point that I'm actually wanting to explain now, it might have occurred to you to ask, why don't we try defining a two-dimensional limit in vector analysis. Why don't we try defining a derivative where it converges from all directions, not just along one line? Why don't we try doing that? Why did we need the complex numbers to do that? Surely we could have done that back in vector analysis. Well, you can. The problem is it gets very, very boring, very, very simple, very, very quickly. Because if you were Imagine insisting on having a two-dimensional limit, and you can quite easily define a two-dimensional limit in R2. We can say, okay, we want it to converge on something from all directions now. The problem is that when you define derivatives in vector analysis, you firstly you split it into components, and that's perfectly common sense. But when you would take this sort of quotient... And you can go in what, let's say you can go in whatever direction. So we imagine little h is a vector in whatever direction. We, we imagine now f is a component that we're studying. We take the change in that component. And then what do you divide it by? 
Well, you can't divide by a vector, and that is the key thing that I want to communicate here. Even though we can say, let's go in whatever direction and try and find um, something that converges from whatever direction, when it comes to actually dividing, all you would be able to do is divide by the length of that vector. You can only divide by a scalar, and that is the crucial difference here. That is why we study complex analysis, why it is more incredible than vector analysis. I've stressed to you in previous videos in the playlist on complex analysis, and the similarities between the complex plane and R2. They have the same topological structure, they have the same algebraic structure as far as addition is concerned. Adding two complex numbers is completely the same as adding two vectors together over here, but multiplicatively, complex numbers are far more incredible. You can multiply any two complex numbers together, you cannot multiply any two vectors together. You can only multiply vectors by the scalar field over which the vector space is a vector space over. In this case, it's the real field. And that's crucial because that means that when you define this, you can only divide by a real number, any real number apart from zero, which doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. And that's the crucial difference. When we do it here, we would have to divide by a real number, whereas when we do it here, we can divide by a complex number, and that would make it really boring over here, because we'd then be effectively just insisting that we want the partial derivatives to equal one another, and we want the directional derivative in whatever direction to always be the same. That's what we'd be insisting on if we try to define a two-dimensional limit here and define the derivative according to a two-dimensional limit. We'd effectively be insisting that the directional derivative at this point in whatever direction was equal to, uh, it, it was equal to the same thing in all directions. And that's completely trivial because we'd be saying we want it to be the same if you go this way as if you go this way. But of course, they should be negatives of one another. And the only number that is a negative of or the only vector that is a negative of itself is the identity, the additive identity, i.e. you would get zero. So you'd basically be insisting that the directional derivatives in all directions were zero in all components, and therefore it would just be a constant function. The only functions that would be differentiable in that sense, if we try to define a two-dimensional limit derivative in vector analysis, the only functions that would actually end up being differentiable would be constant functions. And that's why you don't do that in vector analysis, because it's completely boring. The reason you can do it in complex analysis is because you are not dividing through just by a scalar here. You are dividing through by the complex number. And therefore, when you point in a different direction, i.e. when you change h, you are actually changing the thing that you are dividing through here, which means that you're not actually asking the change to be the same whatever direction you go in. If we did it here, you'd be asking the change to be the same in whatever direction you go in, and that's why it would lead to this really boring function, a, a constant function. Whereas here, you're not asking for the change in the codomain to be the same whatever direction you go in. You're asking for the ratio between that change and the complex number that, you, rep, you know, that you're actually going in the direction of to be the same, and that is a different question, and that is only doable because we can divide through by complex numbers, whereas you cannot divide through by a vector, you can only divide through by scalar, so you cannot change the bottom part depending on what direction you're going in down here, whereas it does change depending on what direction you, you're going in uh, that here. So that is why this complex derivative is incredible. Whew. So I hope that is dawning on you. If you are confused, please think this through. This is not simple. This is a huge new concept. It is a huge step up from the real derivative. It is massively different from real derivatives, partial derivatives, directional derivatives. Please think it, think it through and appreciate how incredible it is. So, uh, I think we will have a break in just a moment, but I do want to say one final thing first. A simple interpretation of what the derivative means. Back in uh, multivariable calculus we, and real calculus, we loved to think of derivatives as being gradients. It is better now to change that intuitive understanding of what it means, because it's less easy to 
a pr and it's nice and easy to visualize a complex derivative as being a gradient. So this now is an intuitive explanation of what a derivative is. So the intuitive explanation is, if you go to a point in your complex plane, you've got your function f, you go to a point, and you make a tiny little change. You imagine that h is a tiny little change, a tiny little complex number, and you go to z plus h, and you want to know what is the change that we make in the codomain for that tiny little change that we make in the domain h. That is where the uh, derivative comes into its own. So approximately f at z plus h is going to be equal to f of z plus the derivative at that point times the change that you're making. This is what your new intuition for what a derivative means should be. So what we are saying, you move to a new point z plus h and you want to know what is the approximate new value in the code main. You know what the value of the function was for our original points, you know this, and you know the derivative at that point, then you can approximately say that the new value at z plus h is equal to the old value at z plus the derivative of the function at the point z times the change that you are making in the domain h. And hopefully that is intuitive to you. f prime of z Remember, that is the ratio between the change in the domain and the change in the codomain. So when you multiply it by the change in the domain that you're making, this complex number h, that should become approximately the change in the codomain. Now, of course, for any actual value h, this is not quite true. This is an approximation. However, as h gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this converges on being true. So if you were to imagine that h is an infinitesimal size complex number in whatever direction, then you can imagine that this is true on the infinitesimal scale. That if you move by an amount h in the domain, and you want to know what is the new value of the function at that new point z plus h, then you just take the value at the old point, you take the value of the derivative at the original point, you times it by your change in the domain, which you know, of course, because you've just made that change, and then you add that um, to the original point, and that produces you your new value. That is the intuitive definition, uh, the intuitive, the intuition for what the derivative means now. It is a way of working out how much the function changes for a change in the domain. And we're going to use this hugely, this intuitive um, understanding of the derivative when we prove, the, well not prove, but demonstrate, give an intuitive explanation as to why the product and chain rules are true. So we'll have a break here and continue in the next video.